So I'm going to demonstrate that by creating a new Spring Boot Webflux project. I'm going to go to star.spring.io and uh, yeah, just the example is fine. If you don't know, this is a way for you to create a new Spring Boot project. I'm going to add a dependency. So you have two dependencies when you create a new Spring Boot application. You have Spring Web and you have Spring Reactive Web. Okay, Spring Reactive Web allows you to use Spring Web Flux and Netty. I told you Netty is a way in which you can create responsive applications without the web server holding on to more threads, right? It's not necessary. So this is a way for you to create a reactive Spring Boot application. So I'm going to click on Generate. That's all I need. I'm going to click on Generate and I'm going to extract this thing here. All right, give me a second. I'm going to move this to my code directory. Okay. So here is my project. I'm going to open this in IntelliJ code demo. And then open this in a new window. Okay. So here, okay, it's done with all the dependencies. And uh, it's kind of scanning the um, scanning the packages. Should be ready in just a bit. Okay, so here are the demo. This is the main class. If I run this, it is going to start a Spring Boot application, just like you normally do, right? Nothing special over here. If I were to do local host colon eighty eighty, I should get the the white label error page, which I do, which is awesome, but here, I want to introduce a Flux-based controller, or a mono-based controller. How do I do this? Okay, so I'm going to create a new controller over here. I'm going to call this REST controller. Let me put this in a new class. I'm going to call this my controller. Okay, and this is going to be a REST controller. And so far, it looks exactly like your, your typical Spring Boot development, right? Nothing special. Oops. There's nothing special here so far, right? I'm going to say this is going to be a get mapping of slash demo and then public. Here, when you're creating a method, it typically when you do just Spring Web, what you would return is a, is a string. So let's say I want to return hello, right? I would return a string greeting message. Okay, and then you would return hello world. All right, this is typically how it would work. But with reactive programming, what you're going to do is not return a string itself. Because imagine if this was coming from some service, you would have to block there, right? So imagine this was get message, and this get message was making a call to the database. So this thing would basically block, which means the thread that's calling this method is blocking and now we have a bunch of blocked threads in your in your server which is not good so this is why we want to do reactive right so here's how it works with reactive you don't just return a string you return a mono of a string okay and then since we have added spring webflux you're going to get the uh, import ready as well so now what you're doing is you're saying i am not going to return the string itself i'm not going to block over here I'm going to give you a mono that at some point in the future will give you the value, will emit the value. You go get that value and you return it. You're handing it back to the framework and you let the framework decide. Okay. So let's say I have a service here. Or let me call it a, let me make it a private method over here. I'm going to make it private, met, private mono of string. Let's say we have a compute message which returns mono dot just off hello okay so now what i can do is i can say return compute message okay so now what is happening is I'm going to, again, 
uh, run this thing, you're not going to see anything different in the in the user experience, right? So if I were to if I were to call this API localhost eighty eighty slash demo, I'm going to get back hello. Okay. So as far as the user is concerned, they are going to get an HTTP response because they're not dealing with reactive code, right? You can't give the user a mono or a flux. They have made an HTTP request. They're going to get an HTTP response, which is text. However, what you're doing is you're making your code non-blocking, okay? So let's say this were to take a bunch of time, right? Delay element. I forget what it was called. Hang on. Delay elements. Uh, let's say I delay by this much. Okay. Delay element for a mono. I delay by five seconds. Now what's going to happen? Is this thread waiting for five seconds? Do we have a wait, uh, do we have a thread waiting there for five seconds? No. It is going to. This is going to call this method. Okay. This method is going to be like, hey, I'm going to return this mono. It is going to return. This method is going to return. Okay. This method is not sticking around for five seconds. You remember what happened when we ran that main method without the, the pause there. The method ended. The main method ended, right? Similarly, this method is going to end. It is not holding a thread that it would have otherwise held if this compute message was sticking a while, right? It just returns the mono as a response. And now Spring figures out, okay, this mono returned. This mono was for this HTTP request, which is still waiting. So let me resolve this mono and return the value to the user, right? So I'm going to save this, run this again. As long as I don't hit any timeouts that set for the server, I think this should work. We'll see. So I'm going to access the same call. Notice here, my browser is spinning. It's waiting. It hasn't returned. But here, no thread is waiting over here. Okay, I've kind of removed that. So the only person who has to wait at the end of the day is the person who has made the request. And this is awesome. Rather than have a bunch of blocks in a bunch of different places, you have everything you need here. And then you can do all the manipulation you want over here. So for example, let's say there is another mono. Because you're gonna be dealing with monos, right? Let's say you're interfacing with the database, you're going to say, give me the records, and it's going to give you a, a mono or a flux, okay? So let's say you have another mono. Let's say it's a service somewhere, okay? Get name from DB, okay? And this is going to, again, get the name, and the name is going to be Kaushik, all right? So what I want to do here is I want to compute message. I want to say, get the message get the name, add them together, and send it back as a response. So how do I do this? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to call the compute message, and then I'm going to use the zip width. I told you that our zip width is what allows you to combine two monos or two fluxes, right? I'm going to say zip width, another mono, which is get name from DB. Okay, and now what I'm going to have is Basically, okay, let's let me show you what this means. So what does zip with return? Zip with returns a tuple. Okay, it's basically giving you two values, right? It's gonna do one value, it's gonna do this mono, return, that mono return, each one happening parallelly, and then it's gonna give you a tuple where value one, value two. Okay, here is a pair. You do whatever you want with it. So now what I'm gonna do is I need to map it to a combination, right? So I'm gonna say map of I'm gonna call this uh, T1, T2, okay? So I have a tuple, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to return T1, dot, get T1, this allows me to get the value. By the time it comes to this map, you have resolve the value, right? I'm going to say t1.gett1 plus t2.gett2. T2. T2. Oh, there's just a tuple. I'm sorry. What I'm going to get back is the value, and this is going to be value.gett1 plus value 
dot get t2. Okay, what am I doing here? I am again doing all of this without blocking because the minute you block, the minute you say I'm going to do a dot subscribe and then in the dot subscribe, I'm going to call get name. Well, you're not, you're not doing reactive anymore. You want to return a mono back. So notice what I'm doing. I'm saying get this mono, zip with this other mono, and whenever they both resolve, I'm going to get a tuple and I'm going to map that value, which contains T1 and T2, and I'm going to return instead the addition of those two strings, and that is what I'm going to return from this controller. Okay, now you notice this one takes five seconds. This one takes five seconds. And what's the total time taken by this guy? It's gonna immediately return, right? It's not holding on, it's not waiting for 10 seconds, it's not even waiting for five seconds, it's just returning. But the mono goes to spring or to Netty or whatever. Netty figures out, okay, after five seconds, this both thing got resolved. It's time for me to map, do this map. It is going to do this and return. So the user gets the output in five seconds. And not just that, the duration of those five seconds, we didn't have threads idling around on the server. Okay, I'm going to reload this and we're going to try this again. This should return a response within five seconds and not happen one after another. So I'm going to refresh, one, two, three, four, five. There you go, All right? Around five seconds, we get the response back and the framework is handling it. 